Uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, our topic of discussion today is uh, significant changes from the 2018 to the 2021 IECC, and today's presentation is going to focus on the residential provisions. Um, so talking about the residential updates to the 2021 IECC. Trying to forward here. There we go. All right. Whoops. A little bit of a delay. Uh, your presenters today will be myself, Robert Schlorf, and my colleague, Sean Maurer. Who are we? We are CDEC, the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center. Uh, to put it simply, our mission is to reduce the energy footprint of Illinois and beyond. Uh, what do we do? We're an applied research program at the University of Illinois. We assist buildings and communities in achieving energy efficiency, saving money, uh, and becoming more sustainable. So what does that mean? We help facilities become more energy efficient. We educate, we research, and we advocate for a greener future for us all. Uh, today's webinar is brought to you uh, by the Illinois EPA Office of Energy. Uh, CDAC collaborates with the Illinois EPA to provide code training and technical assistance for the Illinois Energy Conservation Code. Uh, CDEC is a preferred education provider with the ICC, the International Code Council. Um, this present at the end of this presentation, if you provided your ICC information, we will submit a certificate of completion on your behalf. Uh, similarly, um, this presentation is is uh, approved for one uh, credit hour from the AIA. Uh, again, if you've given us your AIA information at registration, we will submit those certificates on your behalf. Um, it does usually take us a little bit of time to get those certificates out there, but um, they will be coming um, after the end of the presentation. Energy code assistance. If you have any energy code questions, feel free to reach out to us. We have the email there, energycode at cdac.org, uh, which actually that's the wrong email, isn't it? It is energycode at illinois.edu. Uh, is the correct current email. Um, we also have uh, our 800 number list in there, 214-7954. We do recommend that you send uh, emails first, if possible. Uh, an email coming into the office comes into multiple people within the office. It gives us a chance to share that email, come up with a, uh, a um, response together um, so that that response can be a thorough, well-written response. You can get that back in writing to you in email, and then you can share it to whoever it needs to be. So we do often recommend that an email is a good route to go. Of course, if you have a quick question or just want to pick up the phone and call us, you're happy to do that as well. Um, we do have online resources at our website. Um, so our website, smartenergy.illinois.edu slash energy code. Um, on that site, uh, you will find our previous workshops and webinars. Um, so you'll find video recordings of our online webinars as well as PDF slide decks. Um, we also have energy code smart tips and some online on-demand training modules. Um, so these online on-demand training modules, you sign up for an online account and you can take these uh, modules on your own time. At the end of the module, there's a short quiz and then you're given a certificate of completion that counts for continued education credits. Uh, I will go ahead Ahead and say that we do have some online modules that already focus on updates from the 2021 IECC. So if you're listening to today's presentation, if you want a little bit more depth or if you didn't quite hear something, uh, go to our website, check out our, our modules. Uh, we have a number of them that focus on the 2021 updates, uh, as well as some previous webinars and workshops that talk about the 2021 updates. So today is not your only chance to hear this information. Uh, energy code training series. So we have a number of archived presentations on our website, as I just said. Um, so the last one that we covered was commercial stretch energy code that is archived and up on our website. The next regularly scheduled uh, training uh, training webinar will be simplified code compliance. So in that presentation, we're going to take a look at uh, design decisions that might lead to simplified code compliance or lead to less complex code compliance. Um, so if you're interested in that, register for the coming webinar. So upcoming events. So today we are here uh, to talk about the 2021 IECC residential updates. Um, we've included today's webinar as well as a webinar tomorrow covering the commercial updates due to some popular demand for uh, information about the update to the 2021 IECC. So again, today we're going to be talking about residential and tomorrow at the same time, we'll be talking about the commercial updates. So if you want to hear about the commercial updates as well, uh, visit the link there at the bottom of the page and join us tomorrow.
All right, the energy, the Illinois Energy Conservation Code. So yes, the new in Illinois Energy Conservation Code is in effect. Um, that code was the was put into effect January first of twenty twenty four. This means that any building permit applications that have a application date after or on or after January 1st of 2024 will need to comply with the new code. Uh, we'd like to point out here, we've had a couple of questions recently that, that that date is the permit application date. That is what determines which code is in effect. Uh, it is not the date that the design was started. It is the date of the building permit application. So just keep that in mind that any building permit applications on or after January 1st, 2024 will need to comply with the new code. Um, access to the 2021 IECC and Illinois amendments. So the site listed there at the bottom on the left-hand side is the ICE, uh, the International Code Council's website, iccsafe.org. That uh, website allows you access to all of the ICC codes in a view-only uh, online format. Uh, in the office, we personally use this format the most. Um, it is a, a very easily accessible format, and the uh, table of contents along the left side uh, is really easy easy to, to hop in and out of different chapters. So we we in our office find this to be a great way to navigate the code. It helps it. It's a little bit easier than trying to flip through the book. Um, so if you if you don't have your new book yet and want to check out the new code, go ahead and check out the link there and, and check out the ICC site. Um, Illinois amendments at the moment, you can reach the Illinois amendments uh, by going to our website and going to the Illinois Energy Conservation Code page. We have a link that takes you to the uh, Illinois Capital Development Board page that we have a screenshot of there on the on the uh, on the slide. That link above is the direct link to the page that the screenshot's showing. So that link to the CDB website there uh, will will take you to the to a sheet where they, to a page where they have both Illinois specific amendments as well as Illinois specific amendments with modifications shown. Um, so both of those documents, PDF documents, are are available on that site. Um, they are working on publishing a combined Illinois uh, code that has the amendments in it already. And as far as I know, that is not quite completed yet. But once it is, we will uh, uh, send out the message and, and let you all know how you can access that combined uh, code version. Um, access to the Chicago Energy Transformation Code. So today's presentation doesn't necessarily cover the Chicago Energy Transformation Code, although the Chicago Energy Transformation Code is based on the 2021 IECC. So a lot of information in today's presentation does overlap some with the Chicago Code. Um, if you'd like to access the Chicago Code, go to the same um, International Code Council uh, site, and they have the new CETC there as well as a read-only copy. Uh, learning objectives for today's webinar. Um, at the end of the webinar, we'll expect uh, that you all will be able to describe the key changes in the updated Illinois Energy Conservation Code, the 2018 to the 2021 IECC, uh, explain the significant challenges for residential buildings in meeting the Illinois Energy Conservation Code and ways to overcome those challenges, explain how compliance with the Illinois Energy Conservation Code will lead to safer, healthier, and more comfortable buildings, describe the Illinois amendments to the 2021 IECC for residential buildings that lead to a reduction in source air pollution. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sean to start us off. Oh, I believe you're muted there, Sean. So we do have a quick poll question first, so I'll get oh, that launched. Um, just a little bit about uh, where do you struggle in the code? Uh, what sections do you, do you have the most difficulty with? And then how comfortable do you feel with the code? Just so we kind of get a feel for the audience here as we move through our presentation. Um, and then we had a couple of questions come into the Q&A while the poll is running. Um, if you didn't personally sign up for this webinar, if you were sent the link by someone else who did sign up, um, you can email us at energycode at illinois.edu. Uh, make sure we have your AIA member number um, so that we can get you um, your certificate and then you can self-report to ICC. Um, and then once we have your AIA member number, we can do that reporting for you. Um, <clears throat> and then yes, we do. Oops, I did not mean to jump ahead in the slides. Um, we do provide uh, a certificate of completion for people that have attended the webinar, so you will have that as well. All right, looks like we got responses into the poll. So 
the different methods of compliance and building mechanical systems seem to be the, the areas people want to touch on most. So we'll, we're covering both of those in today's presentation. Um, it looks like most people are generally familiar with the code and, and could use a refresher or some updates on some key points. Oh, I was not sharing those results, but there we go. Uh, so first thing we're going to get into um, with the update to the 2021 IECC, there were some changes in the definitions of the code uh, to help with clarity uh, and um, with some of the new provisions that have been adopted into the code and needed some specific definitions. So we'll go through those first. Um, first, uh, in the 2018 IECC, um, they had some confusing definitions about uh, demand recirculation systems and um, uh, hot water circulating systems, um, where a demand recirculation system was specifically defined as having um, heated water returned back to the hot water heater through a cold uh, water supply pipe, um, which isn't necessarily uh, specific to demand recirculation systems. Um, standard hot water circulation systems can also return back uh, through a cold water supply pipe, or either system could return back through a dedicated hot water supply pipe. Uh, so the 2021 IECC clarified that with a new definition. Demand recirculation systems specifically have uh, detection of hot water demand in the space, um, <clears throat> where the hot water distribution system it, pumps are kicked on by a signal indicating demand. Um, and then there are specific requirements for demand recirculation systems versus uh, standard uh, circulating systems. And we'll get into those when we get into the mechanical section of this presentation. Um, but a little bit of clarification there where they had a, a mistaken definition that was causing some confusion. Um, some new definitions that have been brought in, on-site renewable energy, uh, since the code is now bringing, uh, considering renewables more and more, uh, so that define that as energy from renewable sources harvested at the building site, so not remote to the site. Um, <clears throat> renewable energy certificates are an instrument that represent environmental attributes of one megawatt hour of renewable energy. Um, a lot of people are sometimes, um, organizations are interested in taking advantage of those tax benefits from those renewable energy certificates. Uh, and then renewable energy resources, uh, energy derived from solar radiation, wind waves, uh, we know the, the renewable sources listed there. Uh, since these are completely new definitions, we just wanted to make sure to highlight them here um, and make sure you knew that they were now included in the code because the code is integrating more and more uh, the renewable technologies. Uh, roof recover uh, in the 2018 IECC, that definition was the process of installing an additional roof covering over a prepared existing roof covering without removing that existing roof covering. Uh, in the 2021 IECC, uh, they've modified that a little bit by removing the word prepared from that definition, makes it clear that the existing roof covering must be left as is, uh, so that membrane can't be pulled off and a new one laid down. Um, you do still have to prepare it by cleaning it and stuff so you get proper adhesion. Um, but they're making a clarification here that that existing membrane stays in place and is not removed. And then you're adding another membrane on top when you're doing a roof recover. Um, the reason that specific definition is in here and needs to be clear is because when we touch on existing buildings, um, there are specific um, requirements that apply to roof recover versus roof replacement uh, and other projects. Uh, the 2021 IECC did update climate zones in Illinois. So there are six counties in the center of the state there um, that have been updated to climate zone 4A from 5A. And that can impact some of your insulation requirements. So it's important to know that. Um, we've highlighted those uh, counties here. Calhoun, Clark, Coles, Cumberland, Green, and Jersey County have all been updated to climate zone 4A. They're no longer in climate zone 5A. Next up is uh, in section R303, um, which is the general uh, content of the code. Um, it talks about the um, climate zones and defines all the counties and lists them there in that section. Uh, it also has some specific uh, descriptions for um, if you don't have specific information for say your windows, it has default values there. Also contained in there is the definition um, of air impermeable insulation. 
Uh, so this is new in the 2021 IECC, where they're giving a precise definition for materials that are considered air impermeable. Uh, they must meet um, certain air permeability requirement, 0 0.004 CFM per square foot at 0.3 inch of water gauge at 75 pascals, uh, might be the more common term used there. Um, it must be tested in accordance with ASTM E2178. Um, so just some examples of air permeable insulation, uh, pretty much most fibrous insulation, fiber boards, cellulose insulation, fiberglass, uh, air impermeable insulation, EPS, XPS, polyiso, certain thicknesses of open and closed cell foam also qualify as air impermeable. Um, for open cell, I believe it's five and a half to six inches. For closed cell, it's, it's two and a half to three inches. Um, but that's uh, something that's been included here uh, as people are becoming more concerned with air barriers um, and making a continuous air barrier around the envelope, what qualifies as that air impermeable insulation when you're trying to combine that insulation with that air impermeable uh, barrier. Uh, next, getting into some of the general recommendations uh, of chapter four, where we're actually getting into the energy code itself. Um, R401.2.5 lays out some requirements for improving efficiency over the base compliance paths. Uh, this is new, the 2021 IECC, um, where the residential is now more similar to the commercial, where previously residential, you complied with the code. Um, now it has uh, these additional performance packages, um, and they've increased these a little bit, and they're supposed to add about a 5% improvement over the prescriptive um, compliance alone. You have to include uh, one additional efficiency package from section R408 to get that 5% improvement. Um, when you're doing the total building performance path, if you're submitting uh, an ecotrope model or REM rate, or sorry, REM design model, um, there's a couple of other different programs that are pretty commonly used uh, for residential performance target compliance. Um, you can either model um, where that package is not included in the model. Um, and so you would have to then build that into the design after the fact and show that that is included in the housing um, construction. Um, but you don't have to model it in the software itself. Your software just has to be slightly better than the code or right at the code and then um, reference design model and it complies, or you can include that package in your proposed design model and you have to show you had that 5% improvement beyond the standard reference design or more um, to be in compliance. So there's a couple of options there. Um, when doing the energy rating index following the ERI path, um, those models, again, you have the option to include that 5%. So your ERI path has to be 5% uh, lower than what's contained in table R406.5. Um, <clears throat> the other thing to note is the ERI targets uh, have been returned to the 2015 IECC level, so they're more stringent again. Um, the 2018 had relaxed those ERI targets a bit. Uh, they've been returned back to the 2015 IECC levels. Um, by Illinois Amendment, we've also added that houses can go through passive house certification for compliance, and then you don't have to worry about any additional compliance. Uh, passive House is already beyond um, the performance of the baseline energy code. So if you comply with Passive House, you go through that certification process, you're already doing better than this code. So there's no additional compliance requirements for that. Um, looking at the additional efficiency package options that have been added, um, there's the efficient envelope option. You can increase your UA um, calculation performance, 5% uh, beyond what's required in the prescriptive tables, uh, and your solar heat gain performance also needs to be 5% better than what's contained in those prescriptive tables. Uh, your next option is to improve your HVAC equipment performance. Uh, so you have to have a target of 95% AFUE or 10% um, heating season performance factor um, with a 16 sear cooling system. If you're going with the ground source heat pump system, those have a heating efficiency rated in COP, so it has to be three and a half COP or better. Um, and all systems must comply uh, for multi-system residences. So if you have a really large house that has two furnaces, both furnaces would have to be 95% or better, not just the larger unit. Um, <clears throat> the next option is to reduce, 
reduce your service hot water energy consumption. Uh, so if you're using a gas unit, has to have an energy factor better than 82%. Uh, for electric, has to be better than uh, 2.0 for that energy factor. Uh, if you're using a solar water heater, uh, then the solar fraction has to be 0.4 or better. Next up is the efficient duct thermal distribution. Uh, for those of you that are already designing homes to have all the duct work entirely within the thermal envelope, this is probably your target and easy one to do. Um, because to comply, the ducts just have to be 100% within the thermal envelope. Uh, if you have a combination ductless or hydronic system, it has to be entirely within the thermal envelope. Um, <clears throat> so no putting ductwork in the attic, no putting ductwork in an unconditioned crawl space or an unconditioned basement area. Um, as long as it's completely within the thermal envelope, you already achieve this uh, efficiency package. Um, the last one uh, that's available is improved air sealing and ventilation. So you're going to target an air leakage rate for the home of three air changes per hour or less and include an ERV or HRV uh, energy recovery or heat recovery ventilation system. Those systems have to have 75% or better sensible recovery with 50% or better latent recovery um, <clears throat> for the system. And you have to have a fan efficacy of 1.1 CFM per watt or better. Um, those energy recovery systems cannot use recirculation to defrost uh, the energy recovery unit. It has to have another means to do that. Um, the reason being is these are gonna be providing continuous fresh air ventilation to the home if you're recirculating your exhaust air into the supply air to defrost, then you're no longer getting that fresh air. Um, so that's the key thing for achieving that improved uh, air sealing ventilation. A lot of the tighter homes are already looking at ERV systems um, to get that mechanical ventilation because it's harder to pull um, exhaust air out of the house or supply air into the house um, with the tighter and tighter envelopes. Uh, so balanced ventilation is already becoming more and more common. Um, so to achieve this measure, it's really that focus on, on the defrost methodology um, that is a significant addition in order to achieve that bonus efficiency package. Next, looking at total building performance compliance. Um, this has been reorganized and clarified a bit. Um, the code used to have individual labels throughout uh, on what were mandatory versus prescriptive measures for compliance. Uh, so if you were took taking one of the alternative compliance paths outside of prescriptive, um, you had to hit those mandatory requirements. So you were looking back through the code um, to see what was labeled mandatory or not. It's now in a table in the performance section and the ERI path. Um, <clears throat> so you just have to meet all those requirements that are labeled as mandatory in that table. Some people find it's easier reference to have the table there and then go back and reference those specific sections than it is to go back through the code and hunt down that mandatory label in the text itself. Um, the proposed design has an annual energy cost that has to be less than or equal to the energy cost of a standard reference design. Um, that's how the performance works. ERI uh, is very similar. It has a table of ERI values. You just have to do equal to or better than those ERI values. Um, the performance backstops have been updated in these, though. Um, so any proposed design must have a building thermal envelope that is greater than or equal to the efficiency and solar heat gain coefficients uh, from the 2009 IECC. Um, so if anyone's looked at an ecotrope model and it has a UA target performance percentage better than code in it, that's comparing back to the 2009 to make sure that your envelope is better than that backstop performance reference. It's not comparing to the current energy code. Uh, so some of you that have already seen those performance um, reports coming in for, for residential properties um, and see that UA target performance value in there and question it, that's because it's comparing back to that 2009 backstop. <clears throat> Looking at the energy rating index, uh, as we touched on, uh, there's a table of values in there that you have to do better than or equal to when you get an energy rating index back. Uh, for those of you that are using REM rate, um, it's probably the most common package for HERS ratings. Uh, the HERS rating is slightly different from the ERI rating, um, mostly due to ventilation requirements and updates. Um, as the HERS performance path updates ahead of the code slightly. Uh, so the there are slightly different requirements there. Um, but essentially for this uh, energy rating performance path, um, 
you have to meet the score and then include a package in your design or model that efficiency package in the um, computer modeling software and get 5% better than the ERI targets here. Um, so there's also a performance backstop here. If you're including renewables in the project, your performance backstop is the 2018 IECC envelope performance levels. If you're not including renewables, your backstop is the 15% uh, worse than the current prescriptive values for uh, the envelope UA performance. Uh, the reason being um, for having a slightly more stringent uh, envelope when you're including renewables is we don't want renewables to be a, a way to compensate for a, a worse designed building. Renewables should be a supplement to the building with proper design. The building is going to minimize its energy use so that you don't have to put as much capital into a renewable project. Um, both these sections have this mandatory requirements listed in tables. Uh, we pulled those tables out and included them here. Um, not any significant changes in what is mandatory versus what isn't between the two codes. It's just a different way to organize it in this code cycle. And then by Illinois amendment, the compliance option for passive house integration, you can go through the passive house compliance process. They do plan reviews. They do um, certification of, of uh, testing reports and things like that. Modeling reports are done with that. Um, so if you can get through the passive house compliance process, provide those certificates to a code official. That's what the code official needs to verify um, that you meet the code. Uh, the energy certificate that is required um, for um, homes, um, new construction projects uh, has been updated a little bit. Um, the insulation ratings, fenestration, air leakage, equipment performance factors, those are all um, the same as they were in the 2018 IECC. It has added in photovoltaic panels um, and the energy rating score um, to this um, certificate. So if you do include renewables, you'll have to fill out the information on this so that future owners know what type of renewable system was installed, what its capacity was. Um, we do have that checklist available on our website, uh, not that checklist, that compliance uh, certificate. Uh, so if you don't have access to one, <clears throat> you can find that on our website uh, at illinois.edu slash energy code. Um, and we can drop that link in the chat as well uh, once we get to our next poll question here. Uh, so I'll launch the second poll. And then Robert will take over talking about updates to the envelope. We've had a couple good questions come in that I want to cover real quick before we move on to. Sure. Uh, so quickly, the poll questions, uh, which of the following is a valid residential compliance path in the 2021 Illinois Energy Conservation Code? There's prescriptive compliance, total building performance compliance, the energy rating index, passive house certification, or all of the above. And then um, the IECC additional efficiency package options aim for what percent improvement over the prescriptive design? Was it 15%, 5%, 30%, or none of those options? So we'll let you guys answer that poll. And Robert, if you want to go through some of the questions. Yeah. Um, I just also dropped a link into the... Oh, looks like the poll is having some issues, maybe. and maybe try to relaunch it. There we go. OK. Um, so I did just drop a link into the chat, that link for that that ends in checklists that will take you to the page that has the energy envelope certificate. Um, but we had a couple questions that were asking about um, building permits and energy code applicability, and then a little bit about enforcement. And we can't go too deep into this during this webinar right now, but a building permit is required for the energy code to be applicable to a project. If a project does not require a building permit, the energy code is not applicable to that project. The bu a building permit is the trigger that applies the energy code. Um, and then in terms of enforcement, 
the the energy code is required throughout the state of Illinois. It is the state law. Um, who is responsible for enforcement? That would be the local building department or the local authority having jurisdiction or AHJ. Uh, they would be responsible for the enforcement of the code. Um, as I said, that's probably about where we can leave that conversation at today, um, but I wanted to cover that really quickly. Um, We've got a couple other questions, but we can maybe leave those until until later. Okay, and the poll and share the results. Looks like everyone most <clears throat> sorry, most everyone got the first question correct. All of those are um, valid compliance paths for the residential performance. Um, and then five percent is the target efficiency improvement for um, the additional efficiency packages. All righty, I will start taking us through the building envelope updates. All right, so first off, we're going to start with insulation updates. Um, one change in the 2021 IECC from the 2018 is that they have moved the U factor requirement table to come before the R value table. So when going through the code, you will see the U factor table first, which is why we have it shown first here. Um, so in our table, the, the first two uh, grayed out lines represent the original 2018 values. And then the, the lower two lines that have highlighted sections represent the 2021 values. Those cells that are highlighted in green are the values that have been updated or uh, the, the requirement has been increased um, in those cells. So you're looking at uh, fenestration U factor in climate zone four, fenestration solar heat gain coefficient in climate zone five, and then wood frame wall U factors. Those are the significant changes. Um, Illinois amendments kept essentially all of the insulation improvements from the 2021 IECC except for ceiling insulation, which was maintained at the 2018 level. So ceiling insul insulation has not uh, been uh, increased. Um, a note there at the bottom, so for mass wall U factors, if any portion of insulation is on the interior of that mass wall, uh, and that portion exceeds more than 50% of the total insulation, both interior and exterior, then the U factor requirements are reduced as listed there. Um, that essentially just takes into account the, the benefits of the, of the mass wall and the properties of the mass wall. And now for, for that to apply, a mass wall must meet six BTU per square foot of thermal conductivity. So just keep that in mind when looking at the mass wall requirements. Um, and another reason that the uh, code has put the U factor table first is to encourage a little bit more flexibility within design. The R, R value table is a little, uh, um, it's more prescriptive in that you you have specific cavity and continuous insulation values that you must that you must hit to hit the prescriptive requirements. The U factor table, as long as your total wall assembly, roof assembly, whatever we're talking about meets the the required U factor, then then you comply with the code. So there's there's more flexibility in terms of design, in terms of what if you want to do something a little bit unconventional or if you're trying to limit thermal bridging in some way, um, the U factor table might allow you more flexibility and a better pathway forward than the R value table. Speaking of the R value table, we'll go ahead and move on to that. So the table is laid out the same with those top two rows being the original 2018 values. Um, so looking at the bottom rows here, the, the biggest change we'll talk about is the wood frame wall R value. So we now have a number of options underneath wood frame wall R values. Um, the first option is a cavity only option. So if you only want cavity insulation, that's going to have to be an R30 cavity insulation. Um, and then the other options all include some level of continuous insulation. So the other options after that are R20 in the cavity and R5 continuous insulation, R10 in the cavity, uh, or R13 in the cavity and R10 continuous insulation, or uh, R0 in the cavity and R20 continuous insulation. Um, so again, the code is really trying to push for that continuous insulation, trying to get uh, the insulation outboard of all the framing. It, it really uh, reduces the, the impact of thermal bridging um, and also putting that, that insulation layer on the exterior of the building gives us a, a potentially better plane for air sealing on the outside of the building rather than on the inside of the building. Um, a note there at the bottom, so Passive House US has uh, 
has included a note within the 2021 IECC that for climate zone five, the assembly of R20 cavity plus R5 continuous insulation um, is a possible condensation and moisture risk within climate zone five. Uh, essentially there, the, the exterior sheathing may not maintain, uh, may not be kept warm enough to limit condensation on the interior of that exterior sheathing in that case. So Fias would rather recommend either straight R30 in the cavity, because in that way you don't have any foam on the outside of that exterior sheathing that limits, limits its drying potential. Um, so R30 cavity does not necessarily have this problem, but if you want to use continuous insulation, they would recommend you either go with the 13 plus 10 continuous or the zero cavity plus 20 continuous, um, just to eliminate any potential moisture and condensation risks. All right, um, the 2021 ICC has also updated the R value calculation um, section. So previously this, this section had just kind of a few simple sentences that talked about summing cavity and continuous insulation R value independently. Um, so they've, they've lengthened the section within the code now to, uh, to have a little bit more specific information for certain circumstances and to define cavity and continuous in slightly different ways. So what they've done is cavity insulation materials uh, can be added together to obtain the total R value for compliance uh, with, with the table's values, um, but you are excluding air films and other construction materials there. So if we're looking at the R value table for compliance uh, and, you're, and you're looking at using potentially two types of insulation within that cavity, you, you sum the two R values of those insulating materials and you ignore any drywall, sheathing board, air films, any of that. You're just looking at the R values of the inf insulation. Um, for blown-in insulation, you use uh, the manufacturer's settled R values um, for that in terms of in terms of determining compliance with the tables. Um, continuous insulation alone shall be used for continuous R value compliance. So again, we're not going to include any air films or other materials. It's just the rated R value of that material. Uh, that is what we can count towards compliance. Um, and then if insulated siding is used uh, for R value compliance, the R value shall be reduced by R0.6. Okay, moving on, um, access hatches and doorways. The 2021 code has updated this section to add uh, some more clarity and to uh, define a little bit of the differences between vertical doors and uh, pull down stairs. So we have this separated into these two categories for vertical doors. Uh, they must comply with uh, table R40213, the R value table requirements, um, and then pull down stairs in climate zone four specifically, do not need to have insulation equivalent to the attic, but only if all of the following apply. The hatch door is rated as uh, R10 or better. 75% uh, of the panel area is R13 or better. The opening net area is 13.5 square feet or less, and the hatch perimeter is weather stripped. So again, if all four of those, if all four of those uh, are met, then pull down stairs in climate zone four do not need to have insulation equivalent to the attic. Otherwise, they do need to have insulation equivalent to the attic insulation. Um, and then down there at the bottom, so uh, talking about insulation um, for the pull down stairs, R40225 attic hatch insulation retention. The, there's been some language added there just to clarify what they mean by retention of the insulation and making sure that it doesn't fall when the door is opened, um, essentially trying to make sure that that insulation stays where we want it to stay and doesn't get moved around or doesn't fall out uh, when the door is opened. Okay, uh, floor cavity insulation. Um, so the, the 2021 code is, has slightly reworked this, this section uh, just to add a little bit more clarity again, and we've created these graphics to, uh, to potentially help a little bit with that. So floor cavity insulation must comply with one of the following. Uh, first, insulation must maintain contact with the underside of the subfloor decking, or you simply fill the available ca cavity. Um, so that corresponds with the first graphic there. Second option here, cavity insulation can con contact the top of sheathing separating the unconditioned space below. So if we look at that second second image there, the second graphic image, that insulation is laying on top of the sheathing that separates the floor above from the floor below. Um, third, a combination of cavity and continuous insulation can be installed such that the combined R value equals the required table value. So again, the last graphic there, you're combining what's in the cavity along with some sort of potentially rigid insulation 
along the bottom to meet the required R value uh, from table 40213. Points two and three, there is a very important note here that for, for those two options, insulation must be full depth at all perimeter framing members and all framing members shall be air sealed. This is pretty important. Uh, the code is trying to prevent any sort of air leaks at that rim joist area that could potentially get into the floor assembly. And then if the air leaks are flowing above that insulation in any way, if that insulation doesn't reach the top of the rim joist and somehow air is able to get in between the insulation and the floor above, that insulation is essentially not doing its job anymore because we have air movement flowing through that space um, that's going to start transferring heat more so than it would if that air wasn't flowing through. So this is pretty important in terms of making these assemblies uh, function in the way that they should, is making sure that that rim joist is air sealed all the way around. Um, in a similar similar lane of thought here, the basement wall section um, has been has been uh, modified slightly. Um, to explain and talk a little bit more about what to do with unconditioned basements. So this is specifically for unconditioned basements, which may be a, a fairly rare occurrence out there, uh, especially for newer, newer structures, but there are unconditioned basements. And in this case, uh, we want the insulate, insulate the floor over the basement but including the stairwell stringers as seen in the show in the in the photo here we don't want to we don't want to leave any sort of gaps underneath the stairs that that he could transfer through so we want to make sure that that's fully insulated um, we also want to make sure that there are no uninsulated ducts or hydronic systems or supply and return diffusers within the basement all of those elements would mean that that basement is either directly or indirectly conditioned um, so we want to make sure that the any ducts are insulated and that there's no supply and return diffusers to consider that basement unconditioned um, walls surrounding the stairwell shall be insulated, um, and then the door shall also be insulated per 40213 and weather strips. So essentially what this is saying is that if we have an unconditioned basement, we want to design our thermal boundary, our, our building's thermal boundary, to, to not include that that unconditioned basement. The thermal boundary is going to stop at the floor line. It's going to go around the stairwell, but is going to be complete around the stairwell and in a, in a way that this will thermally isolate the basement from the space above it. Um, sunrooms and heated garages. So the 2021 code has um, added some added some other language here and added the heated garages to the sunroom section because they are a, a fairly similar low energy space. Um, so these spaces, both sunrooms and heated garages, must be thermally isolated from other conditioned spaces. So as I was just talking about with the unconditioned basement, we want to make sure that these low energy spaces have, have thermal isolation between them and other conditioned spaces. Um, in climate zone four, the minimum ceiling insulation is R19. Climate zone five, the minimum ceiling insulation is R24. Uh, minimum wall insulation is R13. Uh, and then the walls separating the sunroom or garage from other spaces must be fully insulated per 40212. Again, we're, we're trying to create full thermal isolation to make sure that the energy that we spend in conditioning the remainder of the house does not get wasted and in flowing through uninsulated assemblies into a uh, low energy space such as a heated garage or a sunroom. Um, sunroom requirements have essentially uh, stayed the same as 2018 requirements, so there's no real change in the sunroom requirements. It's just that heated garages have been added to this section. Um, and then a the last note there is that insulation requirements listed here uh, apply to the opaque portions of the envelope. Skylight and fenestration U-factors and solar heat gain coefficients apply to the glazed portions. Um, air leakage. Uh, so the 2021 code has expanded uh, and, and added a little bit to the R402411 air barrier, air sealing, and insulation table. Um, so this table is essentially the uh, the table list of things to verify in terms of uh, air sealing throughout uh, throughout a building. Um, they've expanded the air sealing list for foundations. Uh, exposed earth covered with uh, must be covered with a class one vapor uh, retarder. Penetrations through the slab shall be air sealed, as seen in the in the photo there to the right. Class one vapor retarders shall not be used as the air barriers on below grade walls. We want to make sure that those below grade walls are able to uh, have some drying potential to the interior. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not using class one vapor retarders there. Um, and then rim joists shall include an exterior air barrier and be air sealed to adjacent framing members. So as I discussed a little bit earlier, uh, making sure that that rim joist is air sealed is really important for the uh, performance of floor and wall assemblies. 
Um, the section has also added details for narrow cavities. So any narrow cavities that exist shall be air sealed if they are one inch or less and cannot be insulated. Um, an air gap like that can give you a little bit of insulating value, but only if it's air sealed. If air is able to move through that gap, then that then that air gap does not provide us any sort of uh, insulation value, and it could actually uh, contribute to issues. So we want to make sure that those small narrow cavities are air sealed. Um, and if there is insulation added to small cavities like that, it, the insulation must be cut to fit or it must be able to conform to the cavity. So we're talking about mineral wool that's specifically cut to the dimensions of the narrow cavity or potentially some sort of spray foam material that might conform to the cavity itself. Um, and then again, they've added air sealing notes around plumbing and utility penetrations. We don't want to forget those penetrations through this lab or even through walls. We want to make sure that all those penetrations are sealed. Air leakage testing update. Um, so requirements have been added for heated attached and detached garages in terms of air leakage testing. Um, these spaces uh, for heated attached or detached garages must you must visually verify all of the uh, all of the items on the table 402 411 that I just mentioned for air sealing um, and also verify that insulation has been installed correctly. Um, this can be completed by an approved third party or by the authority having jurisdiction, the AHJ. Um, heated garages are still required to be thermally isolated from fully conditioned spaces, as we've talked about before. So having that full insulated barrier between this, uh, this heated garage and fully conditioned interior space. Um, if all of these apply, heated garages are not required to be tested for air leakage. So essentially the, the short of this is that a heated garage does not need to be tested for air leakage, but you do need to make sure that all of these other requirements are met. Um, and we're showing a picture there of a radiant slab. If you are going to heat your garage, a radiant slab might be a good way to do it rather than trying to uh, use some sort of forced air uh, system. So air leakage testing in general, um, the 2021 ICC has added a performance backstop for air leakage testing. So if you are in any compliance path, and this particularly applies to the performance compliance paths, the backstop for air leakage performance is five air changes per hour at 50 pascals. Um, if you're just talking about prescriptive compliance, the, the air leakage testing limit is three air changes per hour at 50 pascals. So if you're, if you're planning to uh, design to the performance path or one of the uh, performance compliance methods, uh, there is potential there for a little bit uh, a, a little bit more of a, uh, um, the, the backstop is extended there for um, air leakage testing performance. Um, they've added a testing exception for heated garages on one and two story homes uh, and townhomes that we just talked about. But again, you must maintain thermal isolation of that space. Um, and then they've added spe a specific procedure for multifamily testing. This was previously included as an Illinois amendment that's now been included in the 2021 IECC. Um, this is based on an enclosure area-based metric of 0 0.30 CFM per square foot rather than air changes per hour at 50 pascals. Um, and this is also specified as a unguarded test. So neighboring units are not pressurized to the same as the testing unit. Um, the photo that we have there at the bottom of the slide, that photo uh, is likely showing a guarded test or a whole building test where the whole building is, is pressurized at once. Um, the requirements of the code here are to do an unguarded test where we're testing each individual unit on its own. Um, Part of the benefits of doing this, this unguarded test is that it also lets us check um, air leakage in partition walls between units, which can also help to verify if the firewall is installed correctly. Um, and it also helps to prevent any, um, you know, airborne, airborne uh, smells, pollution, that sort of thing from filtering from unit to unit. So doing the unguarded test really helps us make sure that each unit itself is isolated from the others. Uh, lastly here, electrical and communication outlet boxes. So this is a this is an entirely new requirement within the 2021 IECC, um, a new section that outlines air sealing requirements for electrical and communication boxes that are installed within the thermal envelope. Um, if uh, outlet boxes are installed and the, uh, this is primarily for uh, air barriers that are on the interior of exterior wall assemblies. So if, you're, if your air barrier is on the interior of the exterior wall assembly and you're installing outlet electrical outlet boxes or communication boxes into that air barrier, those boxes must now be um, tested and listed under NEMA OS4, so the National Electrical Manufacturers Association OS4. Um, these units shall be uh, 
tested to an air leakage rate that does not exceed two CFM uh, at 75 pascals. Uh, these boxes must be marked NEMA OS4 or OS4, and they must be installed per the manufacturer's instructions uh, to achieve compliance. And what this is aiming at is aiming at if that if that air barrier is on the very interior of the wall, and we go ahead and install electrical and communication outlet boxes that are not properly air sealed, we've just punched a bunch of holes into our air barrier, and we could have potential air leakage issues, moisture issues, condensation issues that arise from outlets that are not fully air sealed. Um, so the code is recognizing that. And if, if that air barrier is on the interior of the wall, we, we need to make sure that the electrical and communication boxes that we install are also air sealed and rated for that location. Um, okay, I believe we have another poll question here before yeah. we move on. Uh, which assembly insulation value was maintained at the 2018 value by Illinois Amendment? Was it the wood-framed wall, the ceiling, the slab, the basement, or none of those? And then what is the performance backstop for air leakage? Three, two, or five, or there is no backstop. Uh, and we've had some discussion about the, the condensation uh, comment uh, for the wall assemblies. Um, and that comes back to uh, the drying potential of your assembly. So like if you're doing a typical stud wall with XPS or EPS foam board for that continuous insulation, um, those foam board products don't have the vapor permeability to allow that wall to dry out. Um, so you can trap moisture in the wall. And then if condensation happens, um, the only potential is for it to dry to the inside, um, which may not happen uh, in, in certain... But if you're using... Uh, a fiber board or something that's more uh, vapor permeable, uh, then that wall can dry out and using that 20 plus five continuous isn't an issue. Um, or if your exterior wall assembly has a, a non, um, uh, a material that's not susceptible to water damage, uh, like the foam board itself, your, your OSB or wood products are on the outside of that continuous insulation layer. There's not as much risk then of water damage uh, that can cause rot and, uh, and destruction of that wall assembly. Uh, so that's why there's that conditional note that still allows some of those. Um, but because the code can't encompass every single construction type in it without becoming cumbersome, um, Passive House added that comment um, to make people aware that there are certain assemblies that should be avoided. And that just comes down to, to having that knowledge and, and getting some training on that. Um, but the energy code tries to leave things open to allow different construction types and stuff. Um, and that's why they still include that assembly, even though there is a, a risk with certain assembly types uh, of condensation damage. Um, and it, the debates can go on and on about how, how the code can do that. But the code is trying to allow flexibility. So it's not going to restrict construction types. Um, but at the same time, it's still trying to enforce uh, a healthy and safety construction practices. So there, there's a balance that has to be struck there. Um, we had a question about if ResCheck can still be used to show compliance in the city of Chicago. Yes, you can still use ResCheck for city of Chicago compliance. Um, there are some slight differences between um, the compliance that's required versus what's measured in res check, in which case you'll have to add some supplemental notes that show mm -hmm. the res check shows I'm in compliance and I had to do this little bit extra to comply with the energy code in Chicago as well. Um, but you can still use res check. Um, let's see. And just to add on to that, we will have a new module discussing, online module discussing the Chicago energy transfer mode coming online here within the next couple months. So that could could answer uh, further questions for anyone asking about that. If I remember right, the Chicago permit application information is pretty good about steering you in the right direction in terms of what you need if you do use a res check for compliance. Uh, we did have a question about uh... R value is it acceptable to use three inch closed cell interior with bad insulation on top of that to meet the R30? Yes, um, that is an acceptable methodology. Um, it's we've seen called a flash and bat job. Yeah, yeah. The main thing there is to make sure that that thickness of spray foam is adequate to 
um, serve as an air barrier if that's what it's being used as. Uh, so mm -hmm. careful attention there to the the thickness of that spray foam, depending on what it's being used for. Um, there's a, a lot of questions and stuff. We'll try to come back to those. We're running a little short on time. So yes. we'll try to get through our presentation and then we'll come yeah. back to the, the Q&As here. Yeah. Uh, so we'll share the poll results. Uh, yes, ceiling insulation was the only one that was retained. Uh, there were a couple of questions relating to that in the, the Q&A. Uh, so instead of the R60, it was maintained at the 2018 value of R49 for ceiling insulation. And then the performance backstop that all compliance paths uh, for the performance pathways, the ERI pathway is five air changes per hour. Prescriptive is at three air changes per hour. So it's a little bit of a split there in the answers. Um, prescriptive, you have to hit that three. But if you're doing the performance path or the ERI path, that backstop is five. What we will say is that that backstop of five, if you're doing performance path, you're going to be trading off that air leakage for a very high efficiency HVAC system and improved insulation. Um, because really air changes is where you're getting that benefit. Uh, so a lot of people that are doing performance path, they're doing it by trading off a really, really tight envelope for a little bit less insulation in the envelope. Okay, uh, so we'll go on to talk about residential systems. I'll try to breeze through this pretty quickly as we're coming up on, on the end of the hour here. Um, there's a bit of an expansion for hot water reset here. Mainly, this is just encompassing, instead of only specifying outdoor setback controls for hot water boilers in residential properties, it opened the door to um, using temperature sensing uh, of the hot water, difference between the return loops, uh, load sensing on the inside of the building. So it opened up more reset pathways uh, for hot water systems instead of just specifying a outdoor air reset uh, for that hot water temperature. Uh, ducts in unconditioned space, all of this is the same, except that the energy code has added in that you can calculate a thermal distribution efficiency um, Typically, we see this for ductwork that's under slab, um, but they've opened the door for this uh, in other arenas as well. Um, I've included a helpful link here to a calculator uh, using ASHRAE 152 methodologies to calculate that thermal distribution efficiency for your ductwork. Essentially, it's just accounting for the surface area of the ductwork, um, the type of space that that ductwork is in, if it's in an unconditioned area, and what the temperature difference between what's in the duct and what's expected to be in that unconditioned space is, and then calculating how much energy loss there is and comparing that to if you had the R8 or R6 duct insulation, is that an equivalent value? Um, so it's calculating that R value of that duct work based on energy loss um, through the duct wall. Um, so it's it can get complicated um, as if you have ductwork in multiple unconditioned spaces um, just to verify all those surface areas. But really, the overall concept is as simple as you have a certain temperature going in, a temperature going out. Um, maybe that's a couple of degrees difference. If you calculate what how much surface area that temperature exchange has happened over, you can calculate an equivalent R value for that that surface area. Um, some clarity and expansion of how to determine if ducts are within conditioned space. Uh, so previously there was ducts buried in attic insulation. It's the top image here. Um, there's different ways to do this. You can just have all the duct work completely within the thermal envelope. Um, if you have a ductless or hydronic system, those can be completely within the thermal envelope and that's in conditioned space. If you have duct work that's in an attic or in a building cavity, um, then these other um, conditions apply. So if it's in an attic, it has to be buried in the attic insulation and it has to be air sealed to a slightly higher stringency um, than if it's in uh, conditioned space. So it's one and a half CFM per hundred square foot of floor area for attic duct work. Um, for ducts in floor cavities, um, they must have R19 between the duct and the unconditioned space. So if you've got a bonus room over a garage, um, that duct has to be up against the floor with a minimum of R13 between the duct wall uh, and the, the ceiling to the garage. Um, if you have a duct in an exterior wall, you must have R10 between the duct and the exterior sheathing. If you're using pre-insulated duct, the insulation that's on the duct does count to that R value. Uh, so we've kind of indicated here in our diagrams the dark 
uh, gray is the inside of the duct, and then the light gray is any included duct insulation. Um, we will note that as a best practice, though, just it's best to try to keep the ductwork in interior wall cavities if you're going to run it in. Uh, need to run it through a wall cavity. Um, try to keep it in interior space. Uh, bonus rooms are kind of the one exception. You you, you kind of have to run the ductwork through the floor cavities to get it where it needs to be, uh, or have a mini split ductless system in there so that's all within the conditioned envelope. Um, for duct leakage testing, um, this has generally not been updated, except that duct testing is now required for ductwork that is within the thermal envelope as well. Previously, it was assumed that that duct leakage was leaking into the conditioned envelope of the building, so it was still conditioning the building. It didn't matter that it was leaking. You didn't have to test for it. Um, that's been amended now, as we understand now that if you're leaking air in one place, it's not getting to where it needs to be somewhere else. Um, and so there is now uh, a duct leakage requirement for ductwork within conditioned spaces, although it's it's um, much more lax than if you have ductwork outside conditioned space. Um, so that new requirement is um, eight CFM per 100 square foot of floor area for ducts that are entirely within the thermal envelope. If you have ductwork outside the thermal envelope, then it's four CFM per 100 square foot of floor area if the air handler is included. If the air handler is not installed yet when you do the test, you're doing this pre-construction, you test the supply and return side, add those together. It has to be three CFM per 100 square foot of floor area without the air handler installed. Um, by Illinois Amendment, um, they've added in a floor to this testing value, recognizing that as you get to lower and lower airflow rates, the, the equipment gets less and less uh, able to be accurate um, as it has the same variation uh, uh, error in readings, um, but the actual airflow rate is much, much lower. So it's a greater percentage error on, on those readings. Uh, and so by Illinois amendment, they've said, um, if your duct system is serving less than um, 1500 square feet or less, uh, and the ducts are not within uh, the thermal envelope, or if it's complete within the thermal envelope, but serving 750 square feet or less, uh, then your minimum testing um, has to be 60 CFM and you're compliant. It doesn't have to be better than that for smaller duct systems. Hot water pipe insulation. Um, there's been a slight uh, change here in that even if the pipe is installed in a wall to the inside of the insulation uh, for a hot water pipe, uh, previously that didn't have to be insulated. Uh, they're now specifying that even if that pipe is inside condition space, it has to be insulated with at least that R3 insulation. Everything else here is the same. Um, the last bullet point there with some bold text is for uh, if you have a residential property that you've installed a circulating system or a demand recirculating system, um, the hot water supply side of that has to be insulated. If you have a dedicated hot water return, that has to be insulated. If you're using a common cold water pipe to return your hot water back to the water heater, that does not have to be insulated. And that's because that cold water line in general is going to be low enough temperature that insulating it isn't going to save you heating energy. Um, so insulating it isn't required. Um, but if you're doing a dedicated hot water return, that would have to be insulated. Uh, ventilation fan efficacy numbers have been uh, changed around a bit as far as their groupings. Um, and this table has added in supply only ventilation fans as integrated with the HVAC system. So if you're you're looking at a table going, what's an integrated uh, with HVAC fan? Uh, that's the supply only fan that's pushing air to the air handler for ventilation, fresh air ventilation purposes. Um, most of these otherwise have been uh, unchanged from their previous values. Um, there were some slight improvements for um, bath utility fans. Um, if you need a resource to find uh, those efficacy values, uh, the Home Ventilating Institute um, is the compliance testing um, label that has to be on these fans. And they have uh, a database of products and what they've tested to. Um, so they'll have the rated CFM and the rated Watts 
you can then calculate the efficacy, which we've done here in a table and put some examples of uh, whether they comply with the 2021 IECC or not. Um, so that's a good resource. If you're trying to find products, you can go there and find that information and research ahead of time what you're going to purchase. Um, <clears throat> ventilation testing is a new requirement for the 2021 IECC. Um, so when you install an exhaust only fan or a supply only fan, um, you have to, or a range hood for the kitchen, you have to now test and ensure that the specified vent, uh, airflow rate and CFM is achieved by that fan. Um, previously, what was happening a lot with these ventilation fans is they had a rated CFM on the tag for the unit, but it would be installed with tight bends in the duct or an excessive amount of flex duct and laying in the attic. Um, and then it couldn't actually achieve those airflow rates that were laid uh, listed on the labeling. Uh, so the energy code is added in this requirement to test and verify that you're achieving the design airflow for ventilation. Uh, for ventilation testing, uh, minimum mechanical ventilation rate can be reduced by 30% by Illinois amendment if you have a whole house ventilation system with balanced ventilation and the duct system supplies ventilation directly to each bedroom and one or more of the living room, the dining room, and the kitchen. Uh, so if you're providing fresh ventilation air directly to where people are most commonly occupying the house, um, because that fresh air is where the people are, you can reduce that ventilation rate slightly versus if you're just supplying it generally to the whole house um, through the ventilation, uh, the HVAC central system. Um, because that's more diffuse throughout the space, um, it can be in places like closets and the laundry room where people are infrequently occupying, you would need more ventilation then in order to hit a target ventilation for occupancy of the house. Um, load sizing uh, and uh, sizing calculations for homes, uh, HVAC systems have to have an ACA manual J load calculation and then be sized per ACA manual S. Um, there are tools that are available out there. There's calculators that are available that do that calculation for you. Uh, HVAC contractors should have access to that, but they should be providing these reports for new construction homes. Um, even in existing homes, it's a good idea to have these uh, done for uh, systems if you're replacing a unit um, because homes can improve over time. Maybe you're doing work to add insulation or whatever and then upgrading the HVAC system. You want to make sure it's properly sized so that it works effectively and achieves the efficiency it's designed for. Um, one thing to note here for uh, manual D, the sizing of the duct system, it's not contained in the energy code, but it is required by the international residential code. Um, so duct sizing is also something that's required depending on your adopted version of the code uh, for residential. Um, but if you're looking for approved software, they'll have a label on it like we have displayed here. They'll have the ACA emblem on it and then state manual J approved, manual D approved. Uh, the manual S is a quick calculator uh, by hand, so there isn't a software platform that does that. Um, you have to input data that you get from the manufacturer's data sheets and then calculate um, whether it's a properly sized unit or not. Uh, if you're replacing a unit uh, for a remodel project, uh, and you're replacing the HVAC system, you should do a manual J and S to get a properly sized unit. That That's correct. Um, saw that question pop into the chat. Uh, for interior lighting, uh, the 2018 IECC required only 90% of permanently installed lighting to be high efficacy. The 2021 has updated that to all lighting, 100% of it. If it's permanently installed, it has to be high efficacy lighting. Um, if it's plug-in lighting, like floor lamps, um, those aren't impacted by the code. The code only affects permanently installed fixtures. Uh, and this is slightly different uh, when we could do commercial tomorrow. Uh, for commercial dwelling units, the requirement is still 90% of permanent lighting fixtures. Um, but for residential properties um, um, that are at residential as defined in the code, it's 100% of permanent lighting. Uh, interior lighting controls is a new requirement in the 2021 IECC. Um, so it requires that for permanently installed residential fixtures, they should have a dimmer switch, an occupant sensor control, or other uh, control uh, that can allow the dimming or turn off of that lighting automatically. Uh, exceptions include bathrooms, hallways, 
exterior lighting fixtures have their own controls requirements that we'll touch on. Um, and then lighting for safety or security. So if you're looking at generally multifamily, um, there's generally some security lights and some common hallways and things. Uh, those things are excluded. Um, but for single family homes uh, or within um, multifamily individual units, um, living rooms, things like the kitchen uh, should have some kind of um, lighting controls now. Uh, for exterior lighting controls, this is uh, another new section to the 2021 IECC. If permanently installed outdoor lighting exceeds 30 watts in total power, then it's required to turn off with adequate daylight, um, which can be done by photocell or time clock. If you're using a time clock, then um, there has to be um, the same requirements uh, that you'll find in the commercial code for time clock as far as seven-day programming, holiday programming, things like that. Um, there has to be an override for that outdoor lighting so that you could turn it on if it's a cloudy day or something like that, if it's needed. Um, that override should then reset after 24 hours back to automa automatic operation. Uh, we do note that for most single-family homes, especially if you're using outdoor uh, LED lighting, that 30 watt is a pretty high limit. So this will generally apply to townhome, multifamily type structures. Um, quickly getting into, uh, we're, we're a little bit over 10 minutes over here. I'm going to quickly breeze through um, existing buildings. Uh, some clarifications have been added here uh, when complying using the performance path for an existing building. Um, your design's annual energy cost has a 10% buffer there over the reference design. So you can be 10% worse in the reference design um, and still be compliant. Um, if you're including the addition plus the original building in your performance path design, which can happen on some significant remodels where you're not just doing the addition, you're also touching some stuff inside the house. If you can just show that the whole project reduces the overall energy of the house below that of the original home, that it's also in compliance. Um, when you're doing UA trade-off for an addition, uh, the UA, um, again, you can look at the entire addition plus the original building. Again, if it's lower than that of the original building, that's in compliance. Um, there's been a restriction removed on when to test um, ducting that's in uh, that addition, if you're at extending ductwork, uh, it used to be that you would have to uh, air seal and test that ductwork if the extension was longer than 40 feet. That's been removed now. <clears throat> uh, for alterations, uh, again, the biggest thing uh, here is the removal of that. Uh, if you're altering the ductwork, extending it for whatever reason uh, during an alteration, um, previously in the 2018 IECC, if that alteration was greater than 40 foot in unconditioned space, um, then you didn't need to test that for leakage. Now, if you're doing any work on that ductwork um, during an alteration, um, then it's exempt uh, from that testing requirement. Um, so that, that 40 um, foot limit no longer applies. Uh, all new uh, a ductwork is exempt from testing. Uh, if you're doing a change of occupancy or use, uh, the 2018 IECC uh, used to state any space changing occupancy class that increases demand for energy shall comply with the energy code. Um, and then there was a separate section um, for any space converted to a dwelling unit that was not previously a dwelling unit, such as converting a garage to a dwelling space or some, or converting a commercial space to a dwelling unit. Um, the 2021 IECC has lumped those together and just that any unconditioned or low energy space altered to become conditioned space shall comply with the R502 additions portion, which we talked about just uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, some resources, uh, if you're looking for design temperature conditions for homes, a lot of, if you're using software, um, they'll pull those automatically, um, but this is a good link for that information. Um, if you're looking to access the code books, uh, for the 2021 IECC, we've got links on our website, but this is a direct link to find those here. Uh, if you're looking for the ASHRAE standards, uh, there's also a link here. Uh, they're also accessible online as uh, free to view uh, PDF format um, references. Um, and that can be helpful if you're looking for like ASHRAE 152 to do your uh, thermal distribution efficiency calculations. 
So sorry we went a little bit long. Uh, we had a lot to cover in, in covering the updates to the code. We have one last poll question for those of you that are still with us. Um, which of the following is required by the energy code? Is it the ACA manual J, the manual S, the manual D, or the manual B? Uh, there are multiple correct answers to that question. Um, and then for domestic hot water pipe and residential buildings, I need to launch the poll. There we go. <laughs> um, which domestic hot water pipe and residential buildings needs to be insulated? Is it all piping, those serving multiple dwelling units, three quarter inch lines and larger, circulation and recirculation systems? Uh, and then let's see if we can start answering some of the other Q&A questions that have come in. Uh, when citing the Illinois Energy Conservation Code, do you just say the current edition, the current year, or do you say the 2021 since the base code is the 2021 IECC? Um, when we talk about the code, especially if it's going to be a document that gets referred to over multiple code cycles, we'll just say the current edition of the Illinois Conservation Code because it gets updated on a three-year cycle. Um, so that would be a good way to reference the, the energy code if it's a document that's going to be used in perpetuity. Right. Um, so yes, I do believe ResCheck does have a specific selection for 2022 Chicago Energy Transformation Code. So. There's someone here that's saying that I believe I believe both ResCheck and ComCheck have specific um, Chicago Energy Transformation Code selections. Um, we had a question here about ACA J and S are required for replacement or just for recommended. Uh, if you're replacing a unit, so you're taking out a furnace or air, air conditioning unit and putting in a new one, um, that's um, triggers the chapter five of the residential code, which is for existing building alterations. Uh, in that section, it refers you back to chapter four, where you do have to do sizing calculations for that equipment. So if you're replacing equipment in an existing building, um, you should be doing a, a sizing check for that um, that new equipment. So uh, that JNS should be done. Um, does ductwork insulation include exhaust ducts for bath fans? That does not. Um, because you're exhausting out air that is already room temperature, there shouldn't be a significant temperature difference between that, the air in that duct um, where it could cause condensation in an unconditioned space. Um, so exhaust ductwork, um, the exhaust ductwork on like ERVs, HRVs, um, those are not required to be insulated. It's only supply and return ductwork um, related to conditioning the space that needs to be insulated. Um, let's see, anything come into the chat? And Robert, you've been answering a lot of the questions about insulation for the walls and stuff. So. Yeah, I've been trying. There was a question about, um, there is a provision R40222 that talks about reduced insulation value for ceilings without attics. The Illinois amendments did not touch that provision at all. So that provision does uh, apply within the Illinois Energy Conservation Code, but just be aware that, that that specific section does have some specific requirements. If you can't just reduce the insulation value of any ceilings without attics, it has to be very specific to that section. Um, and then the Illinois amendments um, have made, so the, the ceiling roof insulation value per Illinois amendments is R38, but I will note that the Chicago Energy Transformation Code requires R60. So if you are if you work both within the city of Chicago and throughout the rest of the state, just be aware that the two codes are not aligned on ceiling and roof insulation. Um, that probably has a little bit to do with the fact that Chicago adopted their energy transformation code before the state was finalized, had a, had a finalized version of their latest code. Um, so that could be part of it, but just be aware that those that there are different requirements within the city and without. Uh, as far as the poll questions, looks like most people got the first question correct. J and S are required by the energy code. D is required by the residential code or the building code, um, not by the energy code. Uh, and manual B doesn't exist. So, um, And then for domestic hot water pipe and residential buildings, um, it's not all piping, um, but those serving multiple dwelling units, three quarter inch lines and larger, and circulation and recirculation system piping as long as it's not a cold water return pipe, 
would be required to be insulated. All right, let's see. We've, we've gone a little bit over, but I think we can spend a little bit more time if there are some additional questions that have come in. Um, we see a number of questions about, um, I see one here about, if you use R30 closed cell SPF for exterior walls, do you need a vapor retarder on the interior? Um, that closed cell foam is already um, a vapor retarder. Um, in its own right, and then drywall on the inside is, is a vapor retarder as well. Um, so I wouldn't recommend an additional vapor retarder on the interior, as then you can trap moisture between that interior vapor retarder and the closed cell foam. Um, drywall um, generally has enough holes and stuff in it that uh, from our electrical outlets and things like that, that um, it can dry to the interior. Um, so, um, oh. Sorry, I'm thinking about air barriers. Uh, drywall is vapor permeable enough that it can dry back through it. Um, it's not a, a vapor retarder. Um, and so, yes, closed cell foam, uh, if you've got that on the exterior, I wouldn't recommend another one on the interior. The closed cell foam itself acts as a vapor retarder. Right. Now, the one caveat there is you may have to look carefully at the building codes because sometimes they require vapor retarders in situations when... You know, you may have to you may have to talk a little bit with your code official there because I know depending on depending on the residential or building code, it may require a vapor retarder even if you are using closed cell foam there. So it could be worth a conversation with the uh, the building official. Yeah, yeah. Um, Chicago does require R sixty uh, for the ceiling, but the wall insulation levels match the twenty twenty one. So it's R thirty, the R twenty plus the R five, the R thirteen plus the R ten, or the R twenty mm -hmm. continuous. Um, completely. Right. Uh, there's some other questions here to get into building science. Uh, we'll try to follow up with you by email and we can get a more exact answer for you. Um, talking about hybrid wall installation and stuff. We'll try to follow up with you by email later, but thank you all for attending. Um, if you have any additional questions, please reach out to us, energycode at illinois.edu, um, and we'll be happy to get back in touch with you. Thank you all for attending today. Have a wonderful afternoon.